From the pillar of fire and cloud of smoke, God led the people. Through the voices of the prophet, God proclaimed the way to live. Through the power and witness of Jesus Christ, God offered us new life. Thanks be to God who has showered us with blessings upon blessing. Welcome to this time of worship, wherever you are, on this fourth Sunday after Epiphany. While we cannot be together in person, we can still gather around sacred words and proclaim God's faithfulness, power, and love. I am Pastor Richard Brown, Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church in Sebastopol, Tavistock, is a church of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada, Eastern Synod, and a member of the 13 Congregation Strong Nith Valley Ministry Area. In Deuteronomy, God promises to raise up a prophet like Moses, who will speak for God. In Psalm 111, God shows the people the power of God's works. For the church, these are ways of pointing to the unique authority people sensed in Jesus' actions and words. We encounter that authority in God's word, around which we gather, the word that trumps any lesser spirit that would claim power over us, freeing us to follow Jesus. We continue with a prayer of confession and assurance. Let us come before God, seeking God's grace and amending our lives. Gracious and merciful God, we confess to you that we have often bowed to every authority but your own. We've tried to be our own authority and have failed to seek guidance from you, the source of our being. Forgive us. Turn us from false authorities which often promise easy answers. Turn us toward you, the one who offers us the truth in love. For Jesus' sake, amen. Because of Jesus' life among us, his death on the cross, and his resurrection, we have been forgiven and called to be new creations in his name. Thanks be to God. prayer of the day. Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all 
that is broken and speak truth to us in our confusion, that all creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading comes from the book of Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter, verses 15 through to 20. Today's reading is part of a longer discourse in Deuteronomy, an updating of the law for the Israelite community as the people wait to enter the promised land. Here, Moses assures the people that God will continue to guide them through prophets who will proclaim the divine word. The reading. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm is Psalm 111. Hallelujah! I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the congregation. Great are your works, O Lord, pondered by all who delight in them. Majesty and splendor mark your deeds, and your righteousness endures forever. You cause your wonders to be remembered. You are gracious and full of compassion. We give food to those who fear you, remembering forever your covenant. You have shown your people the power of your works in giving them the lands of the nations. The works of your hands are faithfulness and justice. All your precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever because they are done in truth and equity. You sent redemption to your people and commanded your covenant forever. Holy and awesome is your name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who practice this will have a good understanding. God's praise endures forever. Our second reading comes from the first letter to the Corinthians, the eighth chapter, verses 1 through 13. Paul is concerned about how some Corinthian Christians use their freedom in Christ as a license to engage in non-Christian behavior that sets a damaging example to others. Impressionable believers, Christians have also have a responsibility to each other that their behavior does not cause a sister or brother to sin. Now concerning food sacrificed to the idols, We know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so many so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since someone has become a so accustomed to the idols until now, they still think of food they eat as food offered to an idol. 
and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care of that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to the idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound up their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their failing, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel acclamation. Hallelujah. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. For those who sat in the shadow of death, light has dawned. Hallelujah. Our gospel reading is from the Gospel of Mark, the first chapter, verses 28 verses 21 through to 28. The Holy Gospel, according to Mark, glory to you, O Lord. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked them, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept asking one another, What is this? A new teaching? With authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, Jesus' fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. These words were spoken by Martin Luther King Jr. when he concluded his famous I Had a Dream speech during the march on Washington, D.C. in August of 1963. Dr. King was a man of many talents who did great things, but he'll be most remembered as one who lived for his people by speaking and acting for them with prophetic authority. Martin Luther King Jr. was born in Atlanta, Georgia in January 1929. He followed the path of his father and was ordained a Baptist minister at age 18. He was a brilliant student graduating from Moorhead College in 1948. He then attended Crozer Seminary in Philadelphia, where he developed his ability as a public speaker and eventually achieved a doctorate in theology from Boston University in 1955. The Rocky Road, a service that King would travel, began rather harmlessly. He left Boston with his new bride, Coretta Scott, and settled in Montgomery, Alabama, where he had been appointed pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. All was normal, settled and calm, until December 1st, 1955. That day, Rosa Parks, returning home after a busy and tiring day at work, refused to move to the back of a Montgomery City bus as mandated by the law at the time. That event changed Martin Luther King, Jr. 
it initiated a transformation in the United States. King accepted the invitation of the African-American community to lead a boycott of the Montgomery transportation system. He saw the injustice that had been perpetrated. He answered the call, met the need, and spoke and acted with boldness and authority. The course of Dr. King's career as leader of the American Civil Rights Movement was now set in motion. For the next 13 years, he traveled about the nation on a campaign to bring justice and to feed the needs of his people through his prophetic voice. In 1960, he returned to his native city of Atlanta as pastor of his father's former parish, Ebenezer Baptist Church. Along the road of justice, he was many times incarcerated. While in the Birmingham City Jail in 1963, he wrote, without the aid of any outside sources, his famous letter from a Birmingham jail, which is considered a masterpiece of contemporary theology. Later that same year, he led the aforementioned March on Washington. In 1964, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts to bring justice to the American, to the African Americans. He led drives for better housing in Chicago and racial justice in Selma, Alabama. In April 1968, he traveled to Memphis, Tennessee to lead a strike by the city sanitation workers. On the evening of April the 3rd, he attended the rally for the workers and although not scheduled to speak, did so in a dramatic and memorable way, addressing the crowd in biblical and prophetic words. I've been to the mountaintop and I've seen the promised land. The next day, an assassin's bullet ended Dr. King's life and his campaign for justice. He was only 39 years old. In his relatively short life, he served the African-American community specifically and the world at large as a prophetic voice. Undeterred by opposition, he spoke with authority in imitation of the one upon whom he patterned his whole life and work, that of Jesus Christ. When we hear the word prophet, what images and names come to mind? Possibly some think of those who stand on the street corner with a Bible in their hand and preaching hellfire and damnation for those who refuse to reform their lives. Others may think of the door-to-door -door sale of religion. Still others may think of it as a former parish pastor who not only preached the gospel, but lived the gospel in his or her everyday life. Then there are the names of the biblical prophets that are familiar to all. Abraham, Moses, Noah, Jacob, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Elijah, Ezekiel, Amos, Hosea, and the one from last, one, last week's reading, Jonah. And yes, there were female prophets as well, called the prophetess. And these included Deborah from the book of Judges and Miriam, the sister of Moses. A prophet is one who speaks God's word. A prophet speaks with great authority, but often incurs significant responsibility. Numerous examples can be given of prophets in ancient Israel who called by God to proclaim God's message were forced by their vocation to walk the privileged road as one of God's messengers. But also the difficult path as well as it was laden with significant responsibility and resistance from the populace. Amos and Hosea were sent by God to the northern king, kingdom of Israel to warn the Jewish religious leaders that God was displeased with them. Similarly, Isaiah and Jeremiah proclaimed them 
impending doom to the southern kingdom of Judea unless the nation once again turned to the Lord. In each case, the prophet was responsible for God to carry out God's command and to faithfully and fearlessly proclaim a message that was not popular or welcome, yet it was one that needed to be heard. For Christians, the preeminent prophet was obviously Jesus of Nazareth, for he had personal knowledge of the Father, and through word and action spoke with absolute authority granted to him by God. Today's Gospel reading presents Mark's version of the beginning of Jesus' public ministry in Capernaum, a town Jesus obviously chose as a center for his prophetic mission due to his strategic location as a crossroads for trade and center of activity in Galilee. Mark reports that Jesus went to the local synagogue and taught the people who were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Not only were Jesus' words impressive, but his actions as well. He cast the unclean spirit out of a man, and again the people were amazed with the authority of his actions, that even unclean spirits obeyed his commands. News of his actions began to spread throughout the region of Galilee. As with the prophets of the Hebrew scriptures, Jesus fulfilled his mission by seriously taking his responsibility to proclaim God's message in word and in deed. Jesus' mission was challenging where he proclaimed God's words under all kinds of threatening circumstances. Often Jesus' message raised conflict. It shook people up. His message was challenging the people's sensibilities. Their zone of comfortableness was rocked severely. Some heeded Jesus' mission and became his followers. Others disregarded or were indifferent to the message, and others still were violently opposed to what they heard and saw. Thus, they orchestrated his death. Prophecy did not end with Jesus. We can see prophecy continue in people like Martin Luther King Jr. Other significant prophets of modern time include Oscar Romero, the Archbishop of San Salvador, who was assassinated by a military death squad in 1980 because of his support for the poor and marginalized in his country. Mother Teresa of Calcutta and the retired Anglican Archbishop of Cape Town, Desmond Tutu, who worked tirelessly to dismantle apartheid in South Africa. Some other names you may not be familiar with include Rosemary Radford Ruther, who challenges us to reject sexism, and Gail Ramshaw and Brian Wren, who brought to the light the impact of exclusive language in the Bible and in society. In the church, there are courageous people today who challenge us and serve as prophets. Some speak out on behalf of the homeless. Some speak for the rights of the elderly. Some speak out in support of developmentally challenged and those who suffer from mental illness. Some are advocates for the rights of prisoners and others speak for the poor, the destitute, and others who have no or little voice in our society. Are we listening to these voices? Or is the message we hear too harsh? Do we feel that it's not applicable to us? Do we refuse to listen when people speak the truth? Would we rather run from the message and challenge, and his challenge, than face it square on? 
There are many others in our contemporary society who serve as prophets and probably don't even realize it. Parents who have been given the special authority by God to proclaim the Lord's word in speech and action towards their children. Parents, you too are prophets to your children in a real way. Do you take the responsibility to proclaim God's word, whether it is a word of discipline or praise or love to your children? Are children listening to the word of God that comes to them from advice or challenge from a teacher in the classroom or from a coach on the athletic field or on the ice? Do they listen to their parents and other relatives and believe that God is speaking to them, through them, through others? Contemporary prophets abound in our society. Some may be archbishops, some may be pastors, but most, most are everyday people that we know, that we love, and that we encounter. Let us, therefore, consider our call to speak God's word. Let us all be prophets and act and speak for others with prophetic authority. Let us be inspired by the actions of others. But let us be most inspired by the actions of Jesus of Nazareth, echoing Martin Luther King's words, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Thanks be to God. Amen. Continue with the peace. The peace of Christ be with you always and also with you. And I invite you to share a sign of peace with those that you are gathered with. Over the past week, we have received offerings by mail, drop off, and online. And so we give thanks for the many gifts 
that we have received. O oh God, receive these gifts as you receive us, like a mother receives her child with arms open wide. Nourish us anew in your tender care and empower us in faithful service to tend to others with the same love. Through Jesus Christ, our saving grace. Amen. Prayers of intercession. Called to know, love, and follow you. O God, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Prophetic God, inspire your church to speak with authority and act with strength where the powers of evil are most oppressive and human hearts yearn for dignity and compassion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Drive out the demons of greed and carelessness that wound creation through pollution and overuse. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Send prophets of wisdom and courage to our nation. Move us beyond partisan divisions to a common search for liberty and justice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Healer of every ill, bring hope and solace to those who struggle with the effects of COVID-19 lockdown. Set free those burdened by feelings of guilt, shame, and worthlessness. Visit the sick and those who suffer from COVID-19 with your compassionate spirit, especially with the ones we name aloud or in silence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Strengthen the witness of preachers, teachers, and all who proclaim the gospel, and the witness of parish nurses, counselors, spiritual directors, and all who proclaim the gospel in their vocations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal God, the saints listened to your voice, and you freed them to live and love for you. Open our ears to hear you and follow their example of faith and courage. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Trusting your love and healing, O God, we commend you to all that for whom we pray, knowing, your, knowing you will hear and answer through Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue with the Lord's Prayer. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. For those who sat in the shadow of death, light has dawned. Therefore, we pray with confidence the words of our Savior. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Holy Spirit, your people call out for understanding. Bring yearning hearts and minds the truth of your word. Go in peace. Be the light of Christ. Thanks be to God. <laughs>